Hey there, welcome back, class, to another um, episode. These episodes, these count, I don't know. Another recording of English 375. Today, we are continuing to talk about WH questions and WH question word movement in particular. In our last lecture on Wednesday, it's been a little while, we went over the basics of how to do the tree drawings, the syntactic trees for WH movement question sentences. These were things like, well, what did I eat? What did I eat? Or when did I eat? Or why did I eat? Or which apple did I eat? All these kinds of WH words. We saw how they actually act and behave within a tree structure. And we saw that they end up moving from their original base generated positions up to the specifier of our CP. We also saw why they move. And for this, we introduced this new feature in the C head, which is a plus WH feature that requires a plus WH constituent to check to be in its specifier of CP, to check that feature and make it grammatical. This was very similar to seeing how we had the plus Q feature in the C head previously, which required T to C movement in English, required that tense to move up to C. So today we've got a couple things on our agenda. We're extending out from that basic understanding of WH movement. So if you don't have a firm grasp of that, this class will be a little more difficult, although still hopefully manageable, and you're free to go back and rewatch some aspects of that earlier lecture on WH questions. Today, our plan is this. We're going to start out by looking at WH movement in embedded clauses. So when you have a multi-clause construction, like, um, what do you think I ate? What do you think I ate? Right. Um, we're going to look at those, and then we're going to look at WH islands. These are places where, well, islands in general, not all of them being WH islands. We're going to look at islands. And we're going to look, see that islands are situations, sentences in which you can't move the WH even though you kind of want to. Places where our WH movement breaks down. And that's going to give us some, finally, some constraints on movement. Some constraints on movement. Cool. Let's dive right in. We're going to start out by looking at, um, a comp comparing rather, two different types of WH movement in embedded clauses. The first one we're going to look at as our warm-up sentence for the day is this one. What do you think I ate? What do you think I ate? So if you're following along at home and you'd like to attempt to draw the tree structure for this, go ahead and pause the video and do that now. We're doing the tree structure for what did you think I ate? What did you think I ate? Again, when I'm unraveling this, what I want to find out is what's moved and I want to undo it in my brain so that I can find out where it's in fact base generated. That's going to be our um, D structure, our deep structure. So with a sentence like, <clears throat> what do you think I ate? This what almost certainly doesn't start there. So what I need to find out is where did it come from? Where did it come from? And if we unravel this and we get that WH echo question where you, you know, you sound really exasperated, you can say something instead like, you think I ate what? You think I ate what? And therefore, unsurprisingly, what we see is that what is actually in the complement of this lower VP eat or ate. I ate what? Right? What is the thing that you're eating? Right. We can also look at that from a theta role standpoint. Is what's assigning a theta role to this WH word? How does that help us? Well, remember that theta roles are assigned before movement happens. So if we could figure out where it received its theta role, we could then understand a little bit better about where it was before movement happened. It's like um, archaeology there, right? We're digging for evidence of what it was like before. And we see that the what is the thing that's being eaten. What did you eat? You ate what? So we know that it's going to be now in the complement of that lower VP eat. This leads us into an interesting situation where there's two clauses here. Oh, I can't get my board right today. There's the you think, you think, which takes a CP 
Compliment? You think I ate what? You think I ate what? That's going to kind of be our base generation for this sentence. The interesting thing is that the what seems to have moved out not, not up to the specifier of the lower CP, but actually the specifier of the higher CP, of the think clause, not just the eat clause. And we'll take a look at what that is like in our tree over here. So again, if you want to do this at home, you are encouraged to do so. Otherwise, I have it pre-done over here to save us some time. So we're going to jump right into this. So here's my uh, deep structure for this sentence. So apologies while I finagle a bit. So here's our deep structure. You have this you think in the higher clause with a present tense. You think. Think takes a CP complement. And the CP complement here is I eat what? I eat what with I in the subject position past tense, eat as the verb, and what as the verbal complement. I eat what you think. I eat what. Well, we need to fill out some, some, some features here because we see that some things have changed. So we're going to add in some features now which motivate the necessary movement that get us to from this deep structure to our surface structure. So we see this do you think do you think instead of you think do you think and what that tells us what this little do is telling us is that there's something higher than the subject you and there's something higher up than the subject you there's something in c and in order to get that something in c we're going to need a plus q feature to draw the t up to c that's how we're going to get the do to make you think into do you think that's part of our uh, yes, no questions that we looked at a couple weeks ago at this point. I know I'm glowing from my whiteboard glare today. Nice and sunny out. So I'm going to add that plus Q feature. And I'm also going to move that tense up. Move that tense up like this. So now I added this plus Q feature, which subsequently drew this past, this present tense, excuse me, present tense up into the C head. But we know that tense can't just hang out by itself. It doesn't like to do that. It needs to attach to something. So we added this emergency do. And since do in the present tense stays do, it's going to be do. Do you think I ate what? I eat what? So we still need to take care of this tense. This tense needs to drop down on the E. There's no plus Q feature. We do actually see that tense appearing on the eat, right? What do you think I ate? Ate. And so since we have the eight, we know that the T must have dropped down to V. So we're comfortable doing that at this point. So I'm going to just erase E and replace it with eight there. So we've done two movements. We've taken care of our T movement. In one case, T moved up to C. And the other case, T lowered down onto V. And the difference there, of course, being this plus Q feature, where this has none. This C has no plus Q feature. Now, the last final movement that we need to do here is get this what out of here, right? Now we have, do you think I ate what? Do you think I ate what? And we wanted, what do you think I ate? So again, the only difference between those two sentences is the what appearing all the way up above this do. What position is that? Well, we only really have one possible position. And we've already talked about the fact that um, WH questions end up in specifier of CP. So we're pretty confident that we're going to put it up here and we'll make sure that works once we do that movement. What justifies that movement? plus WH feature in this C head. So in addition to this plus Q feature, we're going to add in that plus WH feature as well. And subsequently, we're going to move our WH word up into the specifier of CP. Things are getting a little messy on our board, so you'll have to bear with me just a little bit through that. And here, I 
here we have it, our sort of, our sort of final form. Our final form, take one. It's not actually our final form. What do you think I ate? Trace. I just didn't bother erasing it and making a trace, but that's a trace. No, however, so that's perfect. We did it. In some ways, we did it. So if this is the kind of sentence that you drew, if you were following along, Yahoo. Congrats. Nicely done. But there's one more question remaining that we have to take care of. Is the path of movement of this what? The path of movement of this what? Does it go there? The question then is, does it go there in one fell swoop all the way from the bottom all the way to the top? Or does it go anywhere first? Does it go anywhere first? And if so, where would it go? Well, I'm going to tell you that it does go somewhere else first. <laughs> it goes somewhere else first. We don't have the reasons for this, so right now you're just going to have to trust me. But I'll show you why, hopefully by the end of this class, depending on how far we get. So what we're going to say is that what down here, this plus wh, initially moves up into this lower spec CP. It moves here first and then it moves out into this higher spec CP. Why does it do that? Stay tuned as we discuss why it must do this, but it does do it. It's gonna leave when it leave, moves there and it leaves there. So it moves, hops up to that lower specifier of CP position, and then it hops up from there to the higher specifier of CP position. It's gonna leave behind a trace to say I was here. It plants its flag right here. What moves up and moves up. The general, to give you a little spoiler, the sort of rule that we're gonna have of why we do this, this is gonna be our constraint on movement, I'm jumping ahead, is essentially a rule that looks like this. It's going to say, when you're moving, you've got a target in mind, right? Different, different structures, different constituents have a certain target in mind. In these plus WH constituents, like we have here in what, they're targeting a sp the specifier of a CP position. They know they need to move to a spec CP. They've already got that figured out. They've already got that much figured out. So that when they move, they look up higher in the tree, and they're looking for a specifier of a CP to move to. And where do they find one? Well, they find the closest one. That's, that's our rule, is you find the closest potential landing site. So this what looks for the specifier of a CP, that, and it finds one here. So it moves there. One, upon arrival, we can think of this as a little narrative, right? Upon arrival, this plus wh phrase looks into C and says, do you have my plus wh that I need? And this C head says, nope, 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 nope. And so thus, this plus wh word in this lower spec CP is unsatisfied. It still has an unchecked plus wh feature that it needs to get checked. So what does it do to check that feature? Well, it's got to keep moving. And so then at this point, it's sitting here and it looks up again and says, okay, is there a spec CP up there that I can move to? And there is. So it moves out of this lower spec CP into the higher spec CP and does the same operation. Upon arrival, it looks at the C head and says, do you have a plus WH feature for me that will check my plus WH feature? And this one does. This one actually does. And thus it checks off its plus WH feature there and it's satisfied. That's why we, that's not really why, I'll show you some hard evidence in English of why we do that, but that's, that's the rule that we're eventually going to lead to, is that you move to your the closest potential landing site. So you can't, in this scenario, knowing that this needs to go to a spec CP, you can't just skip over, pass over this lower CP to get to the higher one. You gotta try it first, and then you can get out, get out of Dodge if you still need to. Remember that, bank that, 
thought this. You have to move to the closest possible one. Bank that for later. That's going to be very important when we talk about islands in part two of this lecture. Before we get there, though, we're going to look at one other embedded clause type. So here we have movement of a WH word out of its low, the clause that it's generated in into a higher clause. What do you think I ate? Now we're going to look at a different sentence, and we're going to look at the sentence, I wonder what I ate. I wonder what I ate. So again, feel free, if you're following along and drawing these trees at home, feel free to pause the video here and draw, attempt to draw the tree. There's an eye here that I smudged with my fingers very gracefully. I wonder what I ate is the sentence that we're going to be drawing for. I'm going to do some um, Frankenstein operations and erase a lot of this. The, the core tree structure here is going to stay the same, but all these crazy arrows and heads are going to change. So give me a minute and I'm going to draw the tree for I wonder, I wonder what I ate. Note that you don't have to change too much here with the lower clause, but the higher clause is different. Oops, I erased too much. It's okay, you can always draw them back. So I've brought us back here to a to our D structure, to our D structure. And you'll note that this looks very similar to how I started my board in this morning's class, right? The only difference here really, I wonder, I eat what? So that's that that's our deep structure. I wonder, I eat what? What is still, just like it was before, the complement of this verb eat. It's still the complement. Really the only thing that's changed is I changed the verb to wonder. And I changed you to I, because now I'm the one doing the wonder. You're not wondering. I'm wondering what I ate. I forgot, okay? I'm a forgetful person. I'm going to adjust my board so I don't wreck my arms. I wonder. I eat what? And so now, just like before, we're going to look at this and compare it to our sentence, I wonder what I ate, to see what sort of transformations, what sort of movements need to happen and how we can justify them. So we'll start with our tense. It's a great place to start when you're doing movement. We're gonna lower down our tense onto wonder because we see I wonder here instead of do I wonder. So we know that there wasn't T to C movement, otherwise we'd have do I wonder. Instead, we just have I wonder. So this present tense lowers down onto wonder. We also have what I ate, and we can see in ate that this past tense must have lowered down onto this verb eat. So both of the tense nodes here undergo T to V lowering, affix lowering. Present tense comes on, comes down, past tense comes down and changes eat to ate. What does this tell us? about our C heads. The fact that we see both, in both instances, we see this tense lowering down in T to V movement. It tells us that we're not seeing any T to C movement, which in turn tells us that there's no plus Q features anywhere in this sentence. Does that make sense why? There's no plus Q features in this sentence. We know it because we can see the evidence of this T to V movement in both scenarios. There's no plus Q features. That's gonna be very important. Now, next, we're not quite done. Now we have the sentence, I wonder, I ate what? We still need to deal with this nasty, not nasty, why did I say that? Deal with this wonderful WH word, what, down there. And where does it go? I wonder what I ate. Well, we, again, we can kind of take linear um, order here as a guide, it's not definitive because we have hierarchical structures in syntax, but it works as an okay guide here. 
And we see that we want what, we know in the linear order, we need what to appear between the subject I and a higher verb wonder. So it needs to go between this subject I and this higher verb wonder. It needs to come somewhere in between here. And what do we have that likes to take plus WH constituents that happens to be in one of these areas? Yeah, of course, we have a spec TP. We have a spec TP. We have a perfect landing site for this plus WH guy in specifier of the TP position. I'm going to close that window in a second. Hold on. Perfect. We have that there. And so what we're going to say then is that this must end up here. How are we going to motivate that class? How are we going to motivate the movement of the WH constituent into this specifier of the CP? Well, we're going to add a plus WH feature here. A plus WH feature. Oh yeah, I've done that a long time ago. Apologies. Okay, so I'm gonna draw in those changes. I'm gonna give us the plus WH feature in the lower C. And the lower C head gets a plus WH feature, which draws up this WH TP what? still kind of bad, but it's hopefully a little less bad. Um, <laughs> I wonder, now we have the sentence, I wonder what I ate. I wonder what I ate, which is exactly the sentence we wanted. Why did I show this sentence? Well, it's interesting to note that this lower, we saw the, the higher C head have a plus Q plus WH feature. Have a plus Q plus WH feature, right? That drew up both the T to C and the WH all the way up. Here we're seeing a different formulation where the lower C head has a plus WH. So we get the WH word staying here. Remember that it moved here last time, but it couldn't find a plus WH so that it kept going. This time it moves to this lower specifier of CP and it finds what it needs right there. So it stops moving. It doesn't need to go anywhere else. It doesn't need to go anywhere else. It's found what it needs. It's plus WH feature in the C head. So it stays there, and we see evidence of this in a sentence like, I wonder what I ate. Perfect. This is really cool in a lot of ways. Um, it shows us some interesting things about these C heads, right? And so what we're starting to see is that these C heads, remember that um, C stands for complementizer, things like that, and if. C stands for complementizer, but nonetheless, we're seeing that the C head controls a lot of the aspects of the clause. So, like, you can kind of cheat and think of them as clause, clausal determiners, like clausal things, right? Not determiners in the sense of A, the, but that they have a big influence on the type of clause. If you have, like we had before, a plus Q plus WH as a C head, you're going to get um, that question. Uh, like, you're going to get the T to C movement, which often gives you did. And you're going to get WH movement, like, what did you think? What did you think? And if you just get plus WH movement, you're going to get the plus WH Thing without the component T to C movement, and you'll get what I ate, what I ate, what I ate, instead of what did I eat. Cool. cool. Another kind of fun, so, so what we're seeing is that there's different types, there's different distributions of C head types. I'm gonna, I'm gonna erase this tree, and we may not even come back to tree drawings today. Um, we're gonna we're gonna work in the abstract for a little bit. So what we've seen are different clausal types, right? We have a clause head that is plus Q minus WH. This is our yes no question, and we have a C head that is 
plus Q plus WH. And this is our WH question. Ah, man. Handwriting today is not my strong suit. Apologies for that. We have a C hat that's minus Q minus WH. And this is just our normal declarative. So we had seen these C heads. We hadn't really talked about it in these words, but we had seen these C heads before, right? So C plus Q minus WH, that's a yes, no question. It's gonna do the T to C movement, but that's it. We have a C head that's plus Q plus WH. This is our normal WH question that we saw in the beginning of class today. And what did you think? What did you think? We've also had this all along without really knowing it. Whenever we left our C blank, it was secretly a minus Q minus WHC, which is just our declarative sentence, like I ate apples, I ate apples. And what we're seeing in this, I wonder what I ate, is a fourth C head type that completes this um, two by two grid, right? This is really a two by two grid. And there's one missing, there's one C type missing. What type is it? What's the one we just saw actually? It's a C head type that is minus Q plus WH. Minus Q plus WH. Remember, that's what we saw in the clausal head of the clause, wonder. I wonder what I wonder. The sentence was what I wonder. And so what you get here are WH questions, WH questions in embedded clauses, essentially. An embedded WH. So this is a cool discovery for us because it really does flesh out our system nicely, nice and symmetrically, if you want to think of it that way, to fill out. We have these two features, which we've seen in C heads, the plus Q feature and the plus WH feature. And we see that we have the full gamut, the full distribution of possibilities. There for these two features, there should be four consequential uh, C head possibilities, and we have evidence for all four of them. It's cool, right? Like that's, that, that like, uh, you know, satisfies the part that wants the, a complete picture here, that this works this way. It's really nice. So that's one reason I show you the difference between these sentences is to show you that C heads can have these different arrangements. To take this one step further, um, how long have I been on? No, oh, not too bad yet. To take this one step further, how do we know what C head we get? Well, in some ways, we the way we've been doing it up to this point is we know what C head, which, which features we want on our C head based on the movement that we see, right? Proof is in the pudding, and that's totally fine. But there's another way of looking at this, which is that the type of C head that you get is actually selected for by the higher clause verb. The type of features you get on your lower clause C head is determined by the verb of the higher clause. So if you get something like think, I think that I like pie, what do you think I ate? Regardless, think is taking this declarative way to go, this declarative C head as its complement, right? If you think of the verb, we'll draw a mini tree. I know I, I said we probably wouldn't draw trees, but I lied. Uh, so we have something like this. you've got this part of the tree where you've got a verb think, we can see that think takes a certain clausal type as its complement. It takes a minus Q minus WH clause head. I think that I like pi. Whereas wonder, the word verb wonder, 
selects for a different type of clause to take as its complement. They don't both take these propositional CPs as their complement, but not the same type. Wonder instead takes a minus Q plus WH. Wonder is going to select for a minus Q plus WH embedded WH question, question type of clause, like we just saw in I wonder what, right? I wonder what I ate. And we can see the consequences of this because I wonder what, we know that this plus WH feature is going to draw forth the what to right here. I wonder what. And not have it appear higher. So that's cool that we see that which we have the full distribution of these clausal heads. And we see that they're, they're selected for by different verbs. Wonder takes this one, think takes this one, etc. And we can encode that in a couple places, right? So we've been talking about it, that it is encoded by the verb. One place we can include that is in, the, in a theta grid itself, actually in the theta grid itself, so that I'll draw the theta grids for both think and wonder. Didn't give myself enough room. Turns out proposition is a big word. Versus wonder. So we, if we draw the theta grids for these two verbs, we can see those selectional properties of the C head coming forth, right? So we want to say that think takes an agent DP, somebody who's doing the thinking, and it takes a propositional CP, but not just any CP, it takes a propositional CP that's minus WH minus Q. A declarative one, where wonder also takes an agent DP, somebody's still got to be doing the wondering, but it takes a propositional CP with plus WH minus Q. This one. Right? So we can actually encode this information, what sort of C head or what sort of CP the verb selects for, we can encode that information in the theta grids that we already had, simply by adding a little extra information. We already had it looking like this. Now we just have it looking like this. That's wrapping up a couple loose ends. That's wrapping up a couple loose ends and, and putting together our theory with these different types of C, C heads. So we're going to move on now. We're going to still be thinking in the abstract. We're going to do some abstracting. But now we're going to move off of, we're going to move to a new topic. We're still going to be looking at WH questions and embedded clauses a little bit. But more so, we're going to be looking at situations where we cannot move WHs. These are called islands. So, in an abstract sense, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna make some, I'm gonna make some statements about what we've done thus far that will highlight some problems that we currently have. So, in these sentences we've been looking at in today's classes, we've been looking at multi-clausal structures. I'm going to depict that in this next segment like this. Here is clause 1, this, this bracket here is clause 1, and this bracketing here is clause 2, right? 
clause one, clause two. Hopefully that makes sense. This is the higher clause. This is what do you think? And this is I eat what? What do you think I eat? Right? We have two clauses and each of these clauses has a potential landing site for WH words, right? This is the specifier of spec CP. This is spec CP and this is the spec CP for the lower one. Each of them has one spec CP, right? Because each one of them is itself a CP and there's only one specifier. That's a thing we learned months ago. So there's two positions. That's what these little underlined areas are, are the specifier CP potential landing sites. So hopefully this is making sense. Again, we're, this, is, this is abstracting away from our trees to make this a little bit easier. And we've also seen that we can get multiple different types of WH sentences in this lower um, CP. So we can get a WH that's a verbal complement like what? Um, you ate what? You ate what? You bought what? So we're gonna we're gonna switch and use buying for these examples. So you bought what? So we have a WH there. We also saw that you can ask questions about um, you can ask questions about something like um, how, how, like an adverb, how. I wonder how how John bought the pineapple. How John bought the pineapple. I wonder how John bought the pineapple. So you can ask a WH, you can ask the what and a how. Those are both appropriate WH questions. I wonder what John bought versus I wonder how John bought the pineapple. Both of those are perfectly acceptable questions that you can draw up. So we have now, you know, you can ask either of these questions and you can move them to either of these slots. If you have um, the think one, you're going to move it up here. So what did you think John bought? Or how did you think John bought the pineapple? That's examples of both of these moving to this higher CP. Or if you have the wonder one, they're going to go down here. I wonder what John bought. I wonder how John bought the pineapple, right? So you can have either of these and you can move either of these to either slot. But the question we need to ask ourselves is can you do both at the same time? We have two things to move. We have two slots to move them to. And we've seen that any of those possible combinations are fine when given any one WH word. But theoretically, we should be able to have two WH words, a what and a how, where one of them ends up in this higher CP and one of them ends up in this lower CP. That should be theoretically possible given all that we know, given our system of grammar up to this point. Do you think it's going to be possible? It's weird. So again, using these, um, these the buying example, you could say, I wonder what John bought with the $20 bill. Or you could say, how do you think John bought the pineapple? The answer being with a $20 bill. But if you try to ask a question like, how do you wonder what John bought? How do you wonder what John bought? Is that a good sentence? How do you wonder what John bought? I like, you know, I'm shifting my intonation around to try and make this a little bit better. How do you wonder what John bought? I can't make that sentence good, where the how moves up here and the what stays low here, but they both move to a specifier of CP position. So that'd be like this. So this would be, how do you wonder what John bought? Trace, trace. It's just not a good sentence, but why not, right? We should be able to do that. We have two CP slots, provided they're both plus WH. These are both also marked plus WH. That should work out. That equation should even, two and two, but it doesn't. It really, really doesn't. <laughs>
Um, and we have our built-in reason. Now you get to see the evidence for me claiming that to get to this higher one, you have to go through the lower one. To get to this higher one, you have to go through the lower one. Or said a different way, each of these, each of these plus WH constituents is targeting as its potential landing site this spec CP position. Each of those plus WHs is targeting the lower, targeting the lower spec CP position. I'm going to redraw this real quick because I smudged everything. Why are they both targeting the lower one? Because it's the closest one. And our constraint, our new constraint on movement is that you always target the closest potential landing site you have. So these things, knowing they want to spec CP, are both gonna target this lower specifier of CP. The problem is, as soon as one of them moves to this lower one, the other one can't. So as soon as uh, how moves, we'll move how out first. So how moves here, and it's all fine and dandy. Now what still wants to target this spec CP because it's still a potential landing site, but it's not a very good potential landing site because it has something else in it already, and that, that breaks it. So now what is stuck because its closest potential landing site has been taken? Even if how moves out, if how continues to move out to this upper one, it nevertheless leaves a trace there. And this trace blocks the movement of what? What still looks at its closest potential landing site, the spec CP, and says, Ah, I can't fit. There's a trace there. There's already something there. I can't go there. And so what this results in is that we cannot get these multiple moving WH constituents out of the same clause. You can't move multiple WH, um, you can't move multiple WH constituents out of the same clause. Once you move one of these, once this how moves out, this clause becomes an island. It becomes an island off which things can't move because it's surrounded by water, right? There's like a strange water and transportation metaphor going on here where this becomes cut off sort of from the rest of the sentence. You can't, what can't leave? It can't leave and we're going to call that an island. This is called a WH island because it's a, another, a second WH word that actually caused the island status of the lower clause. So this is a WH island. A WH island, a place out of which a WH word cannot move. A place out of which a WH word cannot move. Are there other types of islands? I hope, first of all, I hope we see why this is. This, this is our evidence for this rule of you have to move to the closest thing. And if two things want to move to this, then our derivation crashes. There are other types of islands. I'll show you another one quickly in the remaining minutes that we have here. There's also a type of island that's called a complex DP island. A complex DP island. And I'll show you that. This is going to take me a minute because the sentences for this are really long and clunky. We're getting into some weird sentences. If the sentence, how do you wonder what John bought, wasn't a weird enough sentence for you, try some of these ones on for size. Hold on, hold on. This is going to take me a minute. I wrote far too large, and these sentences are far too long. So I apologize for my uh, my just dead silence here. Think of something fun.
Still writing the first sentence over here. All right, I'm done with the first sentence. I'm moving on to the second one. And you're going to have to provide me some grammaticality judgments of strange sentences. All right, I did it. Whew. We got some sentences here. There's two sentences. You got to give me grammaticality judgment. See, I was not just doing nothing. I was, and I smudge it, smudge it with my fingers after all that hard work. All right, I got to grab it from a different location. I'll get better at this. All right, so our first sentence is this. What did Bill claim that he read in his syntax book? What did Bill claim that he read in his syntax book? Do you like it? Or not? Grammatical or ungrammatical? Grammatical. This one's all right. This one's all right. And note that I put a little blank here where the trace goes. So the what has moved out of this, right? That he read what in his syntax book? That he read something. That he read about WH questions in his syntax book. What did Bill claim that he read in his syntax book? Totally good sentence. A very similar sentence. Let's check this one out. What did Bill make the claim that he that he read in his syntax book? What did Bill make the claim that he read in his syntax book? I've read this sentence so many times recently that that actually doesn't sound so bad, but that's a terrible sentence, <laughs> right? If you say that to somebody, if you say this, what did Bill claim that he read in his syntax book? They'll just tell you what he claimed, right? But if you ask somebody, what did Bill make the claim that he read in his syntax book? That's disgusting. It's weird. And what's the difference? So now we want to look at what's the difference. Here, the operation that we've done is we've moved the what out of a lower CP. Claim is just like think. Claim working just like think out of a lower CP into a higher CP. We've seen that operation and that it's very successful. That's totally fine. There's nothing against that. That's the sentence is grammatical. But in this lower one, this, this the sentence here, what are we moving out of? Make, what kind of complement is make taking? It's not taking a CP complement like claim is, or think, or wonder is. It, make, is taking a DP complement. Bill made what? The claim. Bill made the claim. What type of claim? The claim that he read in his syntax book. This is where we get weird. We can move out of CPs like this, but moving out of a DP, moving out of a complex DP, because this is a DP that has a CP, a DP that takes a CP specifier there, not specifier, um, modifier. It takes a CP modifier, which claimed the claim that he read in his syntax book. We can't move out of this DP. We can't move out of the DP. Moving out of a CP is fine. Moving out of a DP is not fine. Even though these sentences are semantically basically equivalent and look very similar, that difference in structure shows us something. It shows us another island that complex DPs form another island off of which you cannot move WH words. This is called the complex DP island. Complex DP island. Do I need you to know much about complex DP islands or memorize complex DP islands class? Nope. Nope, not really. You need to know that this is a thing, but you don't need to be able to reproduce complex DP islands. That's totally fine. The WH islands, like the, like the sentences, how do you wonder what John bought, are much more important. They're much more important because they highlight an important characteristic of movement. And that characteristic of movement is move to the closest potential landing site, that minimality, minimal link condition. Move to the closest potential landing site. 
that's something I do need you to know. And the evidence for that claim, this move to the closest potential landing site, is given to us largely by WH Islands. So you need to know that as your evidence for this uh, minimal link condition, move to the closest. That's it. So we, we did some things. We looked at embedded clauses and we really dove down deep into those C head types where we found the four types of C heads for declaratives, for yes, no questions, for WH questions, and then the fourth one for embedded WH questions like I wonder what. So we saw how that works and how movement happens in two hops. Movement happens in two hops under this principle of move to the closest possible thing. So it moves to the closest. When it doesn't get satisfied, it moves again. It's iterative, successive, su su successive cyclic movement. It's cyclic movement. It just keeps moving up to that same go to a spec CP, go to a spec CP, go to a spec CP, go to a spec CP until it finds what it's after. And if it doesn't find what it's after, well, then it's an ungrammatical sentence. But if it does find what it's after, then it stops moving. So we saw that, and then at this end, we looked at the evidence for why we have that success successive cyclic movement, that iterative movement, first to a lower, then to a higher, why we have this move to the closest thing rule. And that was because of WH islands. We also got to play with some fun sentences. Oh, I have to test you on one last thing before you go. Before you go, there's somebody made the claim, back to our sentence, that your book makes the claim that these sentences sound good, that these sentences sound good. You ready? How do you think John bought what? How do you think John bought what? Is that a good sentence? Or I wonder what John bought how? Ooh, I don't know about that. I don't know. Think about that. Give me an answer to that on Friday's class. This is a grammatical sentence. I wonder what John bought how? Book claims yes. Ross, a little less convinced. Anyway, uh, I'll let you go. It was fun doing some WH. That finishes up our section on WH. We're going to be moving on to bigger and better things on Wednesday's class, so stay tuned for that. Have a great week, and I will see you again then.